Welcome. I'm Brian Lawry. I'm a professor at Stanford University, the Graduate School of Business. And this is the Leadership for Society webinar series focused on race and power. Today, I'm happy to have Professor Ian Lopez, um, Ian Hanny Lopez, who teaches race and constitutional law at the University of California, Berkeley. He is the author of Dog Whistle Politics, How Coded Racial Appeals Have Reinvented Racism and Wrecked the Middle Class, which focuses on the long history of politicians' exploitation of racial pandering um, in the service of maintaining uh, arguably the economic order. And he's also the author of Merge Left, Fusing Race and Class, Winning Elections and Saving America, which explains how the political manipulation of coded racism has evolved in the Trump era. Um, and before we get started, I'd like to start today um, in honor of Martin Luther King with a quote from his last book, written the year before he was assassinated. The book is, Where Do We Go From Here? And the quote is, why does white America delude itself? They believe that American society is essentially hospitable to fair play and to steady growth toward racial harmony. But unfortunately, this is a fantasy of self-deception and comfortable vanity. As the nation passes from opposing extremist behavior to the deeper and more positive elements of equality, white America reaffirms its bonds to the status quo. All right, Professor Lopez, I'm really excited to have you and maybe work to unpack a little bit of that quote. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Professor Lowry. Although, if it's okay with you, perhaps I could just call you Brian, you can call me Ian. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> much horrible. preferred, much preferred. Okay, all right, let's go that Fantastic. way. Fantastic, all right, good. So, so you know, King is writing at a time when the country's already, um, um, not just the country, um, the country outside the South is moving into a mode of backlash against civil rights. So through 1964, there was a perception that civil rights meant ending formal segregation in the South. And there was broad support for that. And if Bull Connors is the face of white racism, then yeah, that man is evil. Let's, let's get behind uh, taking away his power, reforming Southern society. But by 67, it was clear that this would require substantive reform, significant reforms in the North as well. And a backlash was developing. The quote is also really relevant today in 2021, because it's a quote that asks us to think about whether white America is really prepared for equality and to think about the way in which white America is responding to movement toward racial equality. And I think that, that as we try and understand Trumpism, as we try and understand the insurrection, the invasion of the riot in Congress um, last week, that's really a very challenging conversation about coming to terms with what whiteness has meant and what whiteness continues to mean in our country right now. Yeah, I agree. It's a challenging conversation. And I just want to be upfront. It, it might be particularly challenging because um, I identify as a Black man and I'm seen that way. Um, and I don't, I don't know how you identify. I'd love to hear it. But certainly with a name like Lopez, people likely identify you as Latinx or something similar. Um, and it's often hard to talk about white identity and um, maybe even more challenging when the people having the conversation. And again, I'll, I'll let you speak to your identification when I don't identify as white. Yeah, I think that that's right. And I think it also goes well beyond that. So I identify as Latino. Um, but I think that, that part of the part of uh, one of the main attributes of whiteness is a sort of um, um, a floating above, a floating outside of race, um, that somehow race is something that people of color have, but not something that white people have. And, and, and connected to that is a sort of an innocence um, that white people are constituted as full humans, not significantly shaped by race. And then connected to that um, is what's been termed white fragility, a sense of anxiety, a sense of um, being under attack when the conversation turns to race. And it, it's really important to acknowledge it and then also to try and get beyond it, to, to try and say, listen, we are a country that has been structured in terms of race going back 400 years. And we're not gonna deal with it unless we can have 
thoughtful, considered, measured conversations about race. And these conversations, they can be challenging, but they they need they are not they they are not necessarily attacks. They need not be construed as attacks. Really, the, the only way to get get through this is to to really open ourselves up to conversations that make us uncomfortable, that may be unfamiliar, um, but which really all of us as human beings are capable of thinking through and processing and internalizing. And, and it's right. So race is something that we can make progress on. Yeah, I'd like to think about the distinction between whiteness as an, as an idea and white people as a category. Um, in part, I think this is, again, as, as a black man from the outside and someone who studied this and, and talks to people about it, I think maybe part of the problem is um, white people, that category, not the concept of whiteness, doesn't, it's not clear what the positive content of that category is, right? So as a black man, there's a sense of pride in terms of having overcome the community that belongs to overcoming certain struggles or the production of um, culture that's attributed to that category. What is exactly, what's the content, the positive content of the white category? Because without that, yeah. it seems reasonable that people would feel attacked if all it is, all it means to be white is to be racist or to be perceived as such. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's so much there. So let's start with the category. Um, and let me start in a personal way. So my dad's white, my mother's from El Salvador. I was born and raised in Hawaii. Uh, until I went to St. Louis, Missouri for college, I didn't really have a racial identity that was cognizable in the way in which race is constructed on what we call the mainland, right? So I, I come to the mainland and um, I'm, I'm at an elite university. Um, I'm, you know, a little bit browner than most people. Um, there's some double takes, people don't know what to do with me. Uh, but to the extent that I'm articulate, you know, I, I'm competitive at this, at this elite school, um, my English is unaccented, um, people begin to accept me. And I later come to, this is sort of the race theory part, I later come to say, I was extended a presumption of whiteness. I was extended a presumption of being a white person. Um, I, was, I was offered honorary whiteness. But that didn't protect me from police stops in St. Louis, in Baltimore, in Boston, in, in uh, um, uh, Virginia. Um, you know, that didn't protect me from some sorts of harassment from a few of my fellow students. And so, you know, really what I came to understand is these categories, uh, white people, black people, Latinos, they're not rooted in nature. They're fixed by social practices. And, this, and the social practices themselves are malleable, themselves are continuing to shift underfoot. So the first book I write is White by Law, which is tracing legal definitions of whiteness over a couple of hundred years, right? And you can't write a book like that and think, well, let's focus on the category. The category is always shifting. Or another way to think about this, Latino as a race, the idea that Latinos as a race has really solidified over the last four years in part because there's been so much racism aimed at Latinos. And I don't mean to say everybody in the audience has to nod their heads and say, yes, Latinos are a race. I mean to say the idea of thinking of Latinos as a race is much more prevalent now because of changing social practices, right? So. So, so one point here is let's think about social practices. Another point then is, okay, so what is whiteness as a set of social practices? Whiteness is a set of ideas that, you know, we would recognize as, as racist, a, a set of ideas that say, that says being within the white category and also being lighter even if you're not within the white category, or frankly, sometimes even within the light, in the, within the white category, the lighter whites, right? The white Anglo-Saxon Protestant as, a, as opposed to the Southern Italian. Being lighter is better, being whiter is better, better in what sorts of ways? Innocent, law-abiding, rational, capable of self-government, hardworking, decent, committed to fair play, 
uh, in contrast, and of course there must be a contrast because these are relational concepts, being black or being darker is inferior. And in what sorts of ways, being more brutish, less intelligent, um, uh, thieving, lazy, um, incapable of self-control and therefore incapable of self-government, all of these sorts of stereotypes. And now these aren't just ideas. I mean, they are, right? They're racist ideas, but they are the racist ideas on which a lot of the economy, a lot of the political infrastructure, a lot of the culture, a lot of the material infrastructure of our society, the, the concrete of our society has been poured in keeping with these ideas. And it's important that these ideas have material manifestations because it's the very materiality of race that keeps reinforcing the notion that these ideas are true. And so just a, you know, the, the sort of a East Palo Alto to Palo Alto kind of, you know, um, um, uh, movement. As you walk from a neighborhood that has a long history of segregation and disinvestment and that is primarily occupied by working class or by poor brown and black people into a neighborhood marked by, um, by resources, by, by segregation that favored whites, um, by high levels of education, by very high levels of income, it takes an awful lot to look at that and say, oh, these are social practices that created that, rather than to move through those environments and at a subconscious level, have your mind reaffirm the racist beliefs that say white is better, light yep. is better, black and, 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 light and, and dark is inferior and dangerous. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's all over the country, right? So as you near the communities that sit not too far apart where there's huge differences in how those communities are, are living, right? So you, it's a, across the proverbial tracks, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I still wonder if you, so the way you're describing, if I understand correctly, you could eliminate whiteness as an idea, as a sense that white is better, white is innocent, white is smarter. You could eliminate that without eliminating, obviously, white people. Is that is that true? And if so, what, what's that, left? In that's the that's true, but, you're at, I'm, I'm so glad you came back to this question because it's such an enormously important question. You know, so, so um, uh, here's what we're doing among many progressives. Among many progressives, we're saying um, um, there really isn't anything positive about whiteness and white people need to repudiate whiteness as a set of ideas and they need to grapple with their own guilt for the tremendous damage done to our society through endorsements of racial hierarchy, through practices of racial hierarchy. They need to recognize and dismantle the privileges that have helped them. That is, being white in the sort of um, uh, progressive mindset these days, being white is a major liability. It's, it's, it's a problem. You, you need to do something about it, right? And it's, it's guilt and privilege and repudiating whiteness. Um, and that's great as, as an ideal, and I applaud those whites who are able to do it, but we should also be clear, that's very, very few people. Very, very few people are able to look at their identity, look at it critically, gain some critical distance from it, retain a sense of self, and yet at the same time, remake how they position themselves in society and how they see um, um, what it is that they've earned as opposed to what it is that's illegitimate about how they've been advantaged that can recalibrate their relationships with others. It's extraordinarily difficult. And I, and I, and I say all of this, let me also add, um, as, the, as the coda to my first book, White by Law, this was my basic advice. My basic advice was, hey, white people, you should really work against whiteness because there's nothing good about it. Right, and, and I just think it's a tremendous mistake. It's a tremendous mistake to do that. And I think that the, the way we see that is partly pragmatic. It's advice that people can't follow. And it's advice that actually makes sure that whites remain defensive about whiteness, right? Because it, if, if what they're facing is a prospect of having to remake their sense of self, 
many whites will instead react by saying, I don't think there's a problem here. You're attacking me, you're the problem, right? So we actually, the, the conflict remains, <clears throat> pardon me. If instead, so it's pragmatic, but, but, but it's also analytic. That sort of an approach understands people's orientation towards race as being sort of um, uh, simple and unified, that, that, that people react to race in one way, that people are committed to white dominance, for example, or have no commitment to white dominance whatsoever. And in, and in this sort of a, a, an understanding of race, people within the white category are the problem people outside the white category are immune to the problem. But analytically, that's not right. Within the white category, you have people who simultaneously um, um, draw on, often unconsciously, the racism associated with whiteness and who are also consciously really striving to be good, decent, racially egalitarian people. All right, so you've got a lot of whites who are, and a lot of us, right? I, I really, I, I talk about our, our split minds on race. A lot of us are simultaneously drawing on deeply internalized racism and trying really hard not to be racist, to be racially egalitarian, to build cross-racial solidarity. That's true of very many whites. And at the same time, among people who fall in the people of, category, people of color category, you see significant segments of that population drawing heavily on norms of whiteness. And it may not be a claim of I'm white, but it's certainly a claim that says lighter is better. Um, um, people like me are hardworking, innocent, and deserving. People like my neighbors who are darker or more recent immigrants or uh, you know, can be prejudiced against different groups. There's certainly a lot of anti-black prejudice and many communities of color, Latinos, Asian Americans, right? Oh, oh, that's whiteness operating there too. And yet we, we're not so quick to condemn those folks to saying, well, you only have one orientation towards race, right? Almost all of us have split minds on it where we're, we're simultaneously influenced by the status hierarchy of whiteness, seeking what advantage we can for ourselves in terms of whiteness, even if we're not white people. And at the same time, understanding, embracing a value system that says we're all human, we all deserve dignity, we, we, we need to build connections with each other as human beings. We're all re wrestling with that. Yeah, so here, let's get down to brass tacks. You're a white parent, given what you just said, I, I, I appreciate the understanding of the difficulty in, in managing that identity in the current environment, right? The the pull towards taking the advantages associated with it, even though morally you may be, you are really invested and motivated in being a, a good person that really embraces uh, a, a just society. If you're that person, what do you tell your kids about being white? I think, so, so first and foremost, you tell your kids about being white. And even that, you have to understand that's radical advice because for among many liberal whites, the norm is colorblindness. The norm is the best way to not be racist is to never talk about race. But we know from practice, from social psychological research, not talking about race with your kids simply ensures that your kids absorb racist lessons from society at large. So number one, talk to your kids about race. Number two, you know, <laughs> I guess let me back up for, for just a second. Race is one of those weird subjects where because people live it every day, people think it's pretty obvious and that they know it and that they're familiar with it. And, and, I, and I sometimes say, well, look, you spend money every day, but that doesn't, you don't, but that, you, you don't say, well, therefore I'm an economist. Therefore I got the economy. I understand it. Macroeconomics. Yeah, no problem because I have cash and credit cards. That, that's not how that works. If you wanted to understand the economy, if you wanted to talk to your kids about the economy, you'd do some reading, you'd do some research, you'd watch some documentaries. You'd say, oh, I shouldn't talk to my kids out of ignorance. I really need to educate myself. This is a field that requires study. Race is a field that requires study. Yes, we all are living it, 
but the very terms on which we're living it is full of lies and misinformation and racist myths. So I think if, if, if a white parent says to me, hey, how should I talk to my kid about race the fir- or about whiteness? The first thing I'd say is, I'm really, really glad that that's your project. Before you start talking, do some learning. Um, and whether that's you know, reading some of the history uh, or watching some of the documentaries or just practicing with other adults saying, hey, what does whiteness mean? And what has it meant in my life? Um, but you know, let me not completely evade the question. I think the most important thing to communicate is we're all in this together. We're situated differently in our society. Race is real, but race is not fixed and it's not natural. It's human made. And, that, and this is one of the things that, that I think Martin Luther King stressed that I think was one of his most important contributions is every time that he said something critical about society, almost every time he would continue and say, but if we've done this, we can undo it. And I think that's the most important message that parents can communicate to their kids. This isn't fixed. This is, we've done this, our society's done this. We're implicated in it. We can't step outside of it, but we can fix it. Okay, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's close to a, a true answer for what they should say to their kids. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me pivot a little bit and move to politics. I know this is something that's really important to you right now. Um, and you talk a, quite a bit about in um, the dog whistle politics in your, um, one of your recent books. Um, I'm curious how we think about that right now. So you, you know that um, whiteness of race has a greater force when it's not consciously acknowledged. That was one of the points you made in the book. Um, and so I have a few questions there. One, do you, th- do you think that's changing? Do you still think that's true? Because from my perception, it looks like um, President Trump, Donald Trump, the outgoing president, uh, was using a bullhorn, not a, a dog whistle. So I'm curious what yeah. you think now about that importance of kind of not acknowledging race. So, so let me say, yes, it's changing, changing in a very dangerous direction. Um, but also let's, let's, let's be clear about the, the sort of very few people that refers to. So if you ask people whether they're sympathetic to the Ku Klux Klan or to white supremacy, um, you get answers in the range of two to 4% of the population saying, yeah, I'm sympathetic. If you ask Trump supporters, that number tends to double, but now we're we're talking four to eight percent, right? So I, I think it's very very important to be clear that the strategy that Donald Trump is using is a strategy that's fifty years old that really starts after the civil rights movement that starts in response to the civil rights movement. And there's two aspects of the civil rights movement that are relevant. One the increasing anxiety and backlash among whites in the face of demands for racial equality. And two, the broad acceptance among whites that racial equality is the moral position and racism the immoral one. And and what happens is, and again, this is the split minds on race. You get politicians who begin to use language that simultaneously triggers racist fears but is designed to allow people to believe that they are reacting not to racism, but to higher principle. So a conversation in the 1960s, the conversation was states' rights. States' rights pretended that the issue was federal-state relations, when in fact, it was the federal government ordering southern states to end their practices of racial oppression and racial humiliation, or forced busing, or law and order, or welfare queens. Those are all dog whistles and they're dog whistles. I notice this goes back to like what whiteness means. They're dog whistles connected to racist stereotypes about who whites are and about who people of color are. But they're expressed in these terms that allow people to say, hey, this isn't about white and black. No one used a racial epithet. The only question here is, how do I feel about welfare cheats? How do I feel about criminals? How do I feel about putting my children on a bus, right? Now think about Donald Trump's language. Trump was very careful never to use a racial epithet. 
Trump was very careful to, you know, he, he once said, you know, I could walk down the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and people would still love me. True, or largely true. What he couldn't do is stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and start using racial epithets, start saying the S word, the N word, start saying the S word. Because then, you know, his 8%, they would have loved it, maybe, right? The David Dukes and his fans. But although even David Duke doesn't say he's a white supremacist. He says he's simply fighting for the rights of Euro-Americans, right? Again, that sort of evasion. Donald Trump was very careful to use language that allowed his followers to say, this is just common sense, this isn't racism. And, 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 and I wanna be clear, I'm not just saying this on a sort of, um, hey, professor of racism anecdote, that's my impression. Uh, in 2017, after Trump was uh, inaugurated, and again in the in the summer of 2020, I ran m major national focus groups and um, poll testing, and I tested a version of Trump's message, uh, a message that talked about sanctuary cities and countries overrun with gangs and the need to fully fund our police um, to protect ourselves against people who re refuse to follow our laws. We need to take care of our own people first the sort of language that many of us on the sort of progressive political side say, hey, that's, that's a bullhorn. That wasn't recognized as, a, as, as racism. Um, in fact, it was recognized as convincing, not just by a majority of Republicans, but by a majority of Democrats, a majority of union households. And union households, that's important because they're doing a lot of work to educate their membership about how to understand political messaging. So majority of Democrats, majority of union households, majority of Latinos, a majority of African-Americans found that message convincing. It, it can't be that that message is, come, is out and out, is a bullhorn of white racism, and a majority of African-Americans are saying, yeah, I agree. We need to fully fund our police to protect against people who refuse to follow our laws. Right? This, this is racial demagoguery in code. It's that that's, that's why we're calling it dog whistle politics. And now it's gotten more extreme. And the more extreme versions of it are, are fueling, um, pushing people towards the explicit version, towards the out and out, um, I'm a white nationalist, whites are under attack, we've got to fight back. Um, but again, and I mean, this is really remarkable even people who are, who are, for example, members of the Proud Boys, right? So, so avowed, um, um, th th an avowed commitment to violence, to defend against a perceived threat to white people from non-white people. Even many members of the white boys are themselves either Latinos or Asian Americans, right? Who, who really do believe that there's a racial conflict coming, but also feel like, they can be part of this expansive white team, right? So these are, this is very, it, it's an enormous mistake to simplify this and to say, Donald Trump appealed to bigots, Donald Trump spoke in the language of bigots and the people who voted for Donald Trump are bigots and, the, and, to, and to then divide the country between the bigots and all the rest of us. It misses the sort of complicacy, the humanity of many Trump voters, and it misses the way in which many of us, not just regular folks, certainly the pundit class and a lot of the democratic elite are themselves implicated in thinking that these sorts of dog whistles are reasonable and common sense. They think that themselves, and that's an enormous challenge for us on the left. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the way I read it is that racism has been either defined down or defined up out of existence. Right, so people want to see themselves as good people, obviously. And what we've done is allowed the being someone charging you with racism that is a bigger issue than engaging in behaviors that seem racist. Which brings me to the uh, something else I want did want to go back to. I think the inherent innocence associated with whiteness allows people to engage in what is racist behavior and not see it as racist. So if that's what we mean by it's a dog whistle because they don't acknowledge it as as racist then I'm really worried because I don't know what would have to happen for it to be acknowledged as racist, yeah. right? And, and, and um, so I, I just kind of just wanted to make that point and maybe pivot a little bit because I want to talk about um, uh, 
the insurrection, the mob, the riot, whatever, however we want to define it, maybe it's all of those, all of the above at the Capitol and, and tie that to the idea of inherent innocence. So what was, it was amazing um, that people, one, were allowed to walk out after engaging those behaviors, and we can talk about that, but also um, I'm curious what you thought about or what you make of peoples that were engaged, their sense of self as they engaged in those behaviors. They didn't think of themselves like we are rioters, <laughs> we are insurrectionists. They, they saw themselves as doing the right thing. And I'm curious in your mind, is that tied to this idea of whiteness and innocence being joined together? It, it is, but I wanna add another layer to this because part of the way we've been talking about race so far is in a way that, that treats people's orientation towards egalitarianism and racial hierarchy as pretty static. And I wanna add an element of motivation. I, I wanna say people are trying to think through very often unconsciously a, a sort of a what's good for me, what's good for my family sort of analysis of egalitarianism and, and racial oppression, racial hierarchy. And, um, and this can be really quite dramatic. So if you wanna understand the protesters, you have to understand the larger story being told to them by the right-wing propaganda machine. And I'll just, the right-wing propaganda machine includes the GOP, um, Fox and social media, a lot of think tanks, white evangelical churches. There's a pretty coherent story that's being told. And it's a story that says, fear and resent people of color, but hate liberal government and hate liberals because they refuse to control those dangerous people of color and instead coddle them uh, with government giveaways. Turn away from activist government, support the free market, um, uh, build walls, you're on your own, go buy a gun. That's the basic narrative. And, and we can come back and talk about it. I think it's very important to notice it's a racial narrative tied to a, a, a sort of a political economic position liberal government is the enemy, okay? But if that's the story that you've internalized, then what you've come to believe is the way to take care of your children, and I, and I wanna put it in those value terms, right? Because this is people trying to take care of their children. The way to take care of your children is fight for the rights of decent, hardworking, innocent people that are being stolen by angry minorities and their white enablers and their liberal democratic enablers. But that's the story that you're being fed all the time. It's very important that people are thinking through race and racial oppression, racial hierarchy, but also racial egalitarianism in a, through a lens of what takes care of my children, because that opens up the possibility that we can have a very different conversation. And this is, this is what I was working on with all those focus groups and all that national poll testing to tell a different story, to tell a story that says, you're not threatened by people of color. The real danger in your life does not come from your neighbors or people of a different religion or sexual orientation or a different gender, right? All of the sort of culture or politics lies. The real danger in the lives of all of us comes from demagogic politicians who promote division and acrimony, but whose main goal is to serve the interests of billionaires like themselves and their billionaire buddies. In other words, the main enemy are the very few who are trying to rig our economy, our politics, our government for themselves. And their main strategy is to promote division, therefore, the racially egalitarian norms that you already hold, rather than those exposing you to dangerous and undeserving people, those egalitarian norms are actually the pragmatic way in which you take care of your children. Because by building cross-racial solidarity and only by building cross-racial solidarity, can you achieve sufficient political power to bring government back on the side of all working families rather than on the side of these narrow elites pushing divide and conquer politics. 
I, that's a compelling argument, but I'm going to push back against it. <laughs> so I think you're focusing on material outcomes, which I think is when people think about pocketbook issues. Yes. So your situation will be better off that, you know, the stagnation and, and right and wages, all those things are a function, you could argue, of um, the economic elites controlling the political system and possibly using um, race as a means to do that. Um, but it's also the case that there are benefits associated with whiteness that aren't just economic interests, right? The feeling of yourself as being above or, or better than the, the self-perception that's tied to being a part of that, that powerful, beautiful, smart group has value. So when you talk just in terms of pocketbook issues, do you think that that's enough? Are people gonna, are people gonna be willing to give up those other you know, non-material interests Yes, service. it's such a, such a great question. So let me back up and say, the approach that I'm, that I'm advocating is not novel, it's not original. This is Martin Luther King's Poor People's Campaign, right? The, the idea that we can't achieve racial justice except through a cross-racial movement that also addresses economic inequality and frankly also addresses militarism. It's also the ideal that animated the fusion movement at the, at right after the Civil War that said newly emancipated people had to find and build common cause with um, poor whites who had supported slavery, but in fact remained heavily exploited by the planter class and that they had to find common cause. Um, and I wanna emphasize that because I wanna, I wanna say, look, this is in some ways the, the, the sort of the heart of, 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 of democracy, that we can build a society in which we take care of each other, but only when we understand our fates are linked. And now we get to your question, okay, but is material interest enough? And another version of your question might be, well, it didn't work in the 1860s and it didn't work in the 1960s. Why might it work now? So let me come back to this idea of material interest. One thing I want to be clear about is you're right, there aren't just material interests of whiteness. There are also psychological interests associated with it, of feeling like this is your country, that your ancestors built it, that you belong, that you're innocent and hardworking, that you're due esteem and respect when you interact with government officials, especially the police, right? Um, and, and um, W.B. Du Bois, when he was talking about reconstruction, talked about these, these material wages of whiteness, these psychological wages of whiteness, and David Rodiger, as a scholar of, of race, writing about Du Bois, gave us that phrase, the wages of whiteness. I'm talking about both the material and the psychological wages of whiteness. And I think it's very important to look at how both of those differ between now and let's say 1968. So if you think about 1968, the material wages of whiteness were incredibly high. Protected jobs, in, uh, protected, jobs protected membership in unions, uh, protected access to, to schools, to different employers, to better neighborhoods. And at the same time, the psychological wages of whiteness were very, very high. We were just emerging, we we're just moving past express commitments to white supremacy, to, to the superiority of whites, to all, we were just coming to understand that stereotypes about African-Americans and Latinos and Asian-Americans were racist and ugly stereotypes and not statements of fact. Fast forward to 2021, the material wages of whiteness, 50 years of rule by the rich in which wealth from the great middle in America has been siphoned upwards to the economic stratosphere precisely by people like Donald Trump. Uh, the material wages of whiteness today, think about what just happened in terms of the pandemic and a federal government that it was unwilling to commit to protecting working families. And the psychological wages of whiteness, those too have fallen and even reversed. And part of it, and a lot of credit actually goes to not just decades of civil rights activism and gradual transformation in entertainment and sports, but the Obamas as a family in the White House really undercut the idea that one should construct one's identity around pride and whiteness. And then to Donald Trump, 
Donald Trump today is the public face of what white pride looks like. And it's an ugly, distorted, angry, spiteful face. And a lot of whites are looking at that and saying, I, I don't see any benefit to myself in constructing myself as white, right? So why now? It is not certain at all, but I think for the first time in the 400 year history of our society, we really do have an opportunity to convince a majority, a super majority of our population within the white category and beyond the white category, that whiteness is a threat to the lives of their own children and that the best route forward is purposefully building cross-racial solidarity so that we can actually build a better life for our own families as well as for the families of our neighbors. That's a possibility now precisely because of these big and very important changes in the wages of whiteness. Um, that's a, a good segue because you pointed out this is an opportunity for a significant change. I'm not sure it's the first opportunity, but I will agree that it's another opportunity for this country. Um, and so given that, and there are a number of people that are listening right now, what's the most important thing an individual can do to advance racial justice right now? Like if, you ask, if someone asks you, what should I do? What would you tell them? I think I would tell them wrestle with this idea that racism isn't primarily a conflict of whites versus people of color. Racism isn't primarily a hierarchy of whites over non-whites. Racism is primarily a weapon of the rich in which the powerful few intentionally promote a hierarchy of whites over non-whites, intentionally promote conflict between racial groups wrestle with that idea because the possibilities that flow from that idea are truly radical and indeed truly emancipatory because it helps us get out of the idea that we are locked into a conflict in terms of racial groups and that we all have to pick a racial team, defend the interests of that racial group and instead makes clear we really are all in this together. And it's not that racial hierarchy isn't there. It's not that white racism isn't there. It's not that white privilege isn't a thing that people have to deal with. All of that is right, but it's also correct. It's also imperative that the real people who gain from racial conflict are those who stand behind it, who encourage it, who fund it, who stoke it, who fuel it. Um, and it's, the Donald Trumps, it's the Sean Hannity's and the Tucker Carlson's, millionaire shills for billionaires who shill by promoting racism and racial conflict. If we can get our heads around that idea, we can recommit to the democratic ideal of a pluribus unum, that a democracy works when we make one out of many, not one in the sense of we're all the same, but one in the sense of we're all committed to taking care of each other through the processes of shared governance and making sure that government works for all of us and not just for the powerful few. Great, well, um, that is a, a great place to end. And actually I wanna um, supplement that with a, a final quote from Martin Luther King Jr. After talking about a number of the ills of the country, he had this to say, this does not imply that all white Americans are racist, far from it. Many white people have, through a deep moral compulsion, fought long and hard for racial justice. Nor does it mean that America has made no progress in her attempt to cure the body politic of the disease of racism, or that the dogma of racism has not been considerably modified in recent years. However, for the good of America, it is necessary to refute the idea that the dominant ideology in our country, even today, is freedom and equality, while racism is just an occasional departure from the norm on the part of the few bigoted extremists, end quote. I'd like to say that I, I, I'd like to take from that, that we all have a, a, a moral imperative to think about the country we are part of and how we all participate in it and how we can work to make it a more just place. Um, I appreciate um, Ian, your coming on and talking to us about this. It's been um, really interesting and enlightening. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate the invitation and the conversation. Great. And thanks everyone for joining. <laughs>